Okay, welcome to the first Merit Education Rounds of 2022. Uh, Merit's vision is to grow a community of scientists and clinicians to advance health professions education through research and applied science. Um, thank you all for choosing to spend an hour with us today and help achieve our vision, which to me clearly includes an international community. I definitely recognize attendees from all over Canada, the US, um, Asia as well. Um, although we are meeting virtually, um, a lot of us in this event are connected by the land on which we work, McMaster University, um, which recognizes and acknowledges this land as the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations. And within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. For many thousands of years, the first people sought to walk gently on this land, offering their assistance to the first European travelers and sharing their knowledge for survival in what was at times a very harsh climate. We seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land and based in honor and deep respect. May we be guided by love and right action as we transform our personal and institutional relationships with our indigenous friends and neighbors. Before moving on to our to introduce our esteemed guest for today, I will highlight the events planned in the place of traditional merit rounds for February and March. On February 16th, we are hosting a one day online Rethink Clinical Reasoning Conference. You can learn more about the event by following the link in the chat. Uh, registration is still open, uh, so please join us. This event is uh, presented to you in collaboration between Merit and the McMaster Program uh, for Faculty Development. And it's designed to challenge hopefully change the way we think about clinical reasoning and explore ways to conduct research while acknowledging the complexity of healthcare systems and address the structures that contribute to health inequity. On March 24th, we are hosting um, the PSI, um, Physician Services Incorporated Sponsored Visiting Scholars event on the power of community, building inclusive networks of research and support. And I think there's been a link to upcoming events just shared in the chat. So please follow that and you can learn more about the details of the schedule for that day. It would be great to see you all there as well. Okay, so I am very pleased to introduce the uh, Dr. Eric Warm, who has kindly agreed to share with us some insights from his own research. Um, Dr. Warm is a professor of medicine Vice Chair for Graduate Medical Education and the Internal Medicine Residency Program Director at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, so it makes perfect sense that he is completely dedicated to understanding competency-based assessment, especially as it pertains to the entrustment decisions that faculty are asked to make um, and the ways in which we set up our trainees for future success. Um, Dr. Worm's talk today certainly fits within these themes and I think also challenges what might be considered best practices uh, of education, which often promote um, constant self-monitoring in our trainees. Um, with that, I will hand the stage over to Dr. Warm and as he's getting ready to share screen, I will just ask you to note that our standard practice is to facilitate a Q&A session at the end of the hour. Um, and, but you can feel free to share comments or questions in the chat and I will keep track of them for everyone um, and then help get that conversation going. Okay, the stage is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. McTierra. I, I really appreciate it. I, uh, I had a great day yesterday talking to many of the people in your group, just an incredible group you've got. And I just wanna say how impressed I am by the level of thinking and scholarship. Um, so I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I'm going to give you a presentation called Tell Me I'm Great, Tell, uh, How Poor Assessment Practices Make Us Unsafe. And the reason that I uh, created this presentation is just my own thinking about the ways in which we create systems 
that lead to certain behaviors that uh, lead to outcomes we don't want to have necessarily. Um, so I will screen off to my left. I just want to see here. All right. So my learning objectives today are after this presentation, you should be able to recognize assessment practices that lead to unnecessary risk. There is no way you can remove all risk. So the key word here is unnecessary. And I think that we do have a lot of unnecessary risk in the work that we often do. The second would be to emphasize formative over summative assessment in the learning space. And I know there's some debate as to whether there can be any formative assessment, that all assessment might be summative. And I look forward to having that conversation at the end. And then hopefully assess your own learning processes for safety as you begin to think about what, what you are doing or what we are doing together. And I have three ideas, central ideas that I want to weave throughout the presentation. One is that assessment should minimize risk, not lead to it. If the person receiving your assessment is afraid of it or doesn't want it for whatever reason, then well, we're doing it wrong and we should try to do something else. Um, most assessments should be for learning and not of learning. Most assessment and feedback. I, I really believe that the energy that requires, the energy that's required of us to collect information should be given back to the person. Uh, that should be the main, the main thrust of our energies. And then finally, something that's a bit controversial sometimes is that good enough should be excellent and make the best irrelevant. And I will kind of go through that in depth and I'd like to have a conversation about what all that means. So I'll begin today with a tweet that I saw a couple of years ago, a random tweet from somebody I don't know. I don't know who Genevieve Pentecost is, but she tweeted this uh, tweet. Surgeon, during a lap coli, what band is this? Me, guessing, the ligament of trites? It turns out he was asking about the music. Excuse me while I enter witness protection. And the word again was what caught my eye. Like how many of us have been in this moment where we, we have constantly embarrassed during, uh, during our training? How many of us have learners when we ask a question that they, they poke their nose in the book and don't wanna make eye contact with us? How many of us have been that learner who don't want to answer the question in a public space? To make it more personal for those of you who are physicians, uh, remember when you were learning how to look in the eye with the ophthalmoscope and you said you could see the retina, but did you really see the retina? You know how it is? Because in medicine, there's this constant tangle between safety and shame. And uh, I want to spend a little bit on untangling this. So shame, this is the great work of Will Bynum and, and uh, Laura Varpio and all these wonderful educators, uh, is a self-evaluation in response to a negative event, either a perceived transgression, something you did, or failure to recent expectation, something you wanted to do but did not. Shamed individuals attribute a triggering event to something global and unchanging about themselves, such as their intellect, over cap overall capability, and fail to distinguish the self from the behavior. Shame is not the same as guilt. Guilt is a possibly a positive emotion. Guilt is, I did a bad thing, but next time I could do a better thing. But shame is pervasive. I am bad. I am bad. It's personal. And I think that assessment in medical education creates the conditions of shame. And I want us to think about this as a community and not do this. The contributors to shame are well known. There's perfectionism. In my house, an A was an A and a B was an F. Did you grow up in that house as well? There's this high focus on performance. There's no getting there, just be there. There's difficulty with subjective standards. How do we know what anybody's subjective standards are compared to others? And there's this constant comparison to others in which um, you know, this person's in the top 10% of people I've ever met. Uh, these are the letter rec recommendation that I read. And uh, so we have these contributors to shame and the negative effects are well known. Social isolation, people don't want to be part of groups. There's impaired empathy, we know that. Diminished wellness for sure. But what I wanna focus on since we're an education committee is disengagement from learning. And when we set up the conditions that create this, we really have to be careful because assessment should minimize risk, not lead to it. If you don't want to get the feedback I want to receive, I want to give to you, then why? What is the risk to you, the perceived risk? If assessment and feedback is of learning and not for learning, then of learning is like all of me. Now you're talking about personhood and now I'm taking this personal and, and uh, I don't want it. And then finally, good enough never really does mean good enough, right? It's a pejorative in many terms. If everyone has to be above average to be good enough, then the world doesn't work right. So. Let us, let's dive into that and like untangle this combo and see if we can get to some better place. So let's start with safety. Here I've done the old uh, PowerPoint trick of going to PubMed, typing in a word and seeing what the papers have been written. But you can see there's a lot of written about psychological safety in the last uh, really 10 years. And if you look at the number of papers, the people who are in charge of medical systems, the deans and the CEOs, that's what, those are the papers they had available to them. 
people like me in this range when we graduated from medical school. Uh, and then there's today, and there might be a reason for this. So psychological safety comes from the work of Amy Edmondson and others, but she is the leader here, is a, is a shared belief held by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. A belief that the team is safe for risk-taking, a really good definition of psychological safety. When you think about learner safety, you might think about on a two by two square, which I love two by two squares, uh, on respect and permission. If you give a little respect and a little permission, you get through the inclusion threshold and you can say, you can be here, just be quiet, don't say anything, you can be in my team, but I don't wanna hear from you. A little more permission, a little more respect, and you can say to the learner, you can be here and I want you to, I want you to learn, this is why you're here. If you give permission without respect, that's kind of exploitation. Sometimes we do this to people here, go, go be a learner in a space in which you are not prepared. We don't wanna do that. Um, and then if you give respect without permission, that's parentalism. Hey, uh, don't touch anybody. I, you can stand here, but I don't want you doing anything. So you're gonna wanna ride the right ratio here. If you get a little more respect, a little more permission, you can contribute. Hey, what, what is your idea? And then finally, if you break through this threshold, you can be a challenger. Come take this team down. I really want your opinion. Uh, and you have, the, you have the permission to do that. Those are interesting things. Today, I'm going to really focus on learner safety and this, this, this concept of psychological safety. Here's a, an example to so if you kind of get a sense of what this means of, of, of bad psychological safety. Have you ever had the meeting after the meeting? You know, you go to a meeting and there's a lot of talking, but you don't feel safe to say anything. And then you go out and have a coffee with your friend and have a meeting after the meeting to talk about the things you would have talked about at the meeting. Have you felt safe enough to do that? I've I've been on both sides of this. I've caused meeting after the meetings and I have, I have been in the meeting after the meeting. So if you've seen that, you kind of know the downside of psychological safety. The related term of educational safety is the essence of what constitutes psychological safety for learners. And, and the definition here is, is kind of like when, when students feel safe and they don't have to constantly self-monitor in ways that are unhealthy. If you think about a learner, here is a slide I stole from my friend Ben Kinnear who's on the call today. Um, so you think about the person on the far right, what are they thinking about as the teacher's teaching? There's so much stuff that can get in there. There's, there's image management. Gosh, I don't wanna be the dumbest person in this room today. There's inferring the preceptor intent. Uh, what does this person want? Not what is the content, but what does this person want? There's situation management. Maybe this person's a gastroenterologist and I wanna be a gastroenterologist, so I gotta get a letter from this person. There's contextual complications. Maybe all those people on the left went to Harvard and Yale and Columbia and McMaster and I'm coming from Cincinnati, I don't know. All these things in your brain increase your germane load and, and Ben calls them cognitive waste, which I think is true. So if you're in a learning space feeling unsafe and you're worried about these things, how are you focusing on the thing at hand? Psychological safety arises because learners feel understood and cared for as a person, not only by their peers, but also by their preceptors. When I saw that line, I started thinking about what my goal is. What is your goal as a teacher? Is it to teach? or is it to facilitate learning? If it's to teach, the action is, let me tell you something. Here's the thing I know, and here's the thing I want you to know. If it's to fill, facilitate learning, it's let's work on this together. I, I'm only gonna judge myself by what you can do after we're together and not just what I said. If the, the goal of teaching is to give knowledge, here's, here's, here's some knowledge, let me drop it on you. The goal of facilitation of learning is self-efficacy. Here's some knowledge, make sure, I wanna make sure that you can use it. The locus of control for teachers, if it's just purely teaching, as I'm defining it, is external. I do my thing, I taught, you do your thing, you teach, it's up to you what you do with it. I have nothing to do with that. Whereas the locus of control may be internal, a little bit more for facilitating a learning, facil facilitation of learning. I'm gonna do my thing and I'm gonna be with you doing your thing and I'm gonna help you. And I, I think I might have an effect to help you do it better. The safety risk for teaching in environments in which you're receiving this is high because it's all on you. And the safety risk here is lower. And I, I'll tell you that I grew up with this. This is how I learned the, about teaching. And, and I maybe all of you all who've got advanced degrees in, in education way past me, but uh, that's, that's where I grew up. And I, I like to tell the story of when I was a young program director. This is my 12th year. The story I'm going to tell you took place in my first year when I had a resident who was really struggling. And this resident um, didn't really have a lot of insight into how to get better. And so I had to meet with this person again and again and again, week after week. And some, somewhere in April of that year, after I met with this person, maybe 30 times, uh, another afternoon session. Uh, 
the resident asked me, Dr. Warren, why don't you love the residents? And I knew what she meant then or what they meant then was, why don't you love me? But it was a real dagger to my heart because I had to like look at myself and you know what? I, I didn't love this person. I was I was angry a little bit that I I'd come here to be with the best and the brightest and I just couldn't get through to this person and it was really hard and I I wasn't getting anywhere. Um, and what I had done was was gone over here to, to the teaching side. And back then I did not have the skills that I needed to help this person. Now I feel like a little better because I've really worked hard at, at getting better at this moment, but I really had to switch my, um, my own goal. And I, I read this paper years later that really articulated what I was going through at that moment from, from Nora Osmond and David Hirsch. Our self theories may influence how we hear feedback and how we give it. If we educators as learners experience feedback as injurious rather than nurturing, we may be less able to provide actionable feedback to others based on our specific observations. If we ourselves find, if you don't tell me I'm great, I don't wanna hear it. If we are injured ourselves, it's really hard for us to be in that position to help somebody. And as I said, I, I, when I grew up in a house and A was an A and a B was an F. And so I never wanted to hear anything that wasn't give me, you know, tell me I'm getting an A. And it's been this change in the mindset, this paper called When I Say Growth Mindset, a great paper, uh, that I think has really helped me as an educator get over here. Um, and so now when I'm with a learner like this, I feel a lot different. And I, I need to make sure that I'm firmly in their corner and that they understand that. We'll come out to whether, whether they actually under get it, what I'm feeling, but my goal needs to be over here. Psychological safety arises because they feel care for a person. If you take that old Peabody quote, and you, uh, and you take the word patient out and just put the learner in, uh, then I think that's where the action's at. Now, some of you might be thinking, yeah, but I care for learners. What are you saying, Eric? You're saying, I don't. Um, but I'd say, but do we? Do we as a medical establishment care for learners in, in this way? And I wanna introduce you to a concept called normalized deviance. Um, I'm gonna take a little aside to get to a point. So if you already know this, this bit, uh, just uh, pause with me for a second to go here. But this is um, Normalized Deviance was created by Diane Vaughn after the Space Shuttle Challenger uh, in 1986, the Space Shuttle blew up. And um, so here's what this means. Organizational behaviors that deviate from normative standards or professional expectations, that outside people to see, see the situation as deviant, whereas inside people get accustomed to it seeing as routine, rational, or entirely acceptable. So the idea is that there are standards that people on the inside just see as normal and people on the outside see as deviant. How does this even happen? Well, if you have um, an operating margin like that dark line there and you're there and you're doing fine and then something shifts the system so that you go out into the space, uh, you're not quite to harm, harm is where the dash line is. You're like, oh, this happened, this is not good, I don't wanna be here. And there's these kind of correcting actions that take you back to the safe space. But then the system gets perturbed again, there wasn't really any harm and, and then the margin is redefined until you have a new operating point, and when you have a shift again, boom, you're into the disaster. And uh, I'll show you how you get there. So here I'm showing you a picture of the Challenger. I was a freshman in college that year. I came home, uh, I watched this on TV. I'll never forget it. About 30 years later, this person, Bob Ebeling, was an engineer um, for Thiokol, the company that was managing the engineering for this. And he said on NPR 30 years later, I think this is one of the mistakes that God made. He shouldn't have picked me for that job. I don't know, but the next time I talk to him, I'm gonna ask him why, you, you picked a loser. And I thought, what a terrible thing. And he died shortly thereafter. What a terrible thing to, to take to the grave with you. Because the thing is that Bob Ebeling, the night before the Challenger blew up, told his wife, the Space Shuttle Challenger is gonna blow up. And he knew it and he couldn't stop it. So what happened? So you have to know a little bit about the launch uh, in 1986. Gosh, it's almost exactly this 28th, it's almost January, so cold. So the thing about this was in Florida and it's not supposed to be in the 20, 20s in Florida. 20s, this is uh, Fahrenheit. I don't know how that is in, in centigrade, but it's cold. <laughs> so the ground taper, temperature was really, really cold. And this is what the challenger looked like uh, per the internet. This is what the ice coming off the bottom of it. Why does this matter? Because the booster uh, rockets were held together by these things called O-rings. They were 38 feet in circumference and a quarter inch thick. And they were supposed to seal the boosters. And the, the fear was that if, it was cold, they would shrink and let gases out, then could ignite and blow things up. And, and they'd never been tested below 53 degrees ever. And here we are in the 20s and 30s, and it was a serious problem, again, Fahrenheit. And this is exactly what happened. If you look at the, the tape, they didn't see this in real time, but in the tape, 
right as the thing started taking off, there was a puff of smoke as, as the O-rings did not seal. And then we know what happened. And that's why that night they actually knew on the news what had happened. They had a, they had a prediction because they had, they had it. So the question is, how does an engineer know that something bad is going to happen and then can't stop it? And this is what Diane Vaughn worked out uh, and, and her book, um, The Cost of Silence, Normalized De uh, Normalization of Deviance and Groupthink. Um, and there are eight steps to getting here. The first is the illusion of invulnerability. When engineers raise the, raise the possibility of O-ring blow-by, it was said, well, this is true of every other risk we ever had. So just because something hasn't happened doesn't mean it will, but this was, you know, they seemed invulnerable. It's not happened before. There was the belief in the inherent morality of the group. As the engineer said, I had the distinct feeling that we, the engineers, had to prove to the launch people that in the position of having to prove that it was unsafe instead of the other way around. And you know, if, if in healthcare, this is a risky thing when you have to prove to leadership that it's unsafe and they don't believe you. There was a collective rationalization. We were counting on the secondary O-ring to be the ceiling O-ring under the worst case conditions. And I, I'm not an aviator, but I know that if, if you have a mission critical thing, you should never count on the second thing. You should build it in and have it but it should never be something you should count on. You should always make sure the first thing is the first thing that works. There were outgroup stereotypes. My God, Thiokol, Thiokol, the engineering group. When do you want me to launch next April? Then there was direct pressure on the people who were dissenting. Take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat as if my problems are more important than yours. And here's where it gets really difficult. Because the engineers didn't want to get beat on, self-censorships happens. A no-go recommendation below 53 degrees at the pad became Lower temperatures are in the badness of O-rings. And they actually wrote that instead of don't go. And then those people were excluded from decision briefs. And then finally, silence was interpreted as agreement, the illusion of unanimity. All right, what does all this have to do? It's interesting as I'm thinking about this case, a lot of this had to be, do with safety and feedback, didn't it? We couldn't talk to the people who were in charge, but that's not the point I'm making, although it is an interesting little um, sort of uh, parallel. I think that we have significant normalized deviance within healthcare because education harms learners when it provides perverse incentives where grades are seen as more important than growth. If you think about many of our clinical clerks, even in competency-based medical education, because we still rank order people, we still have things you know, nor normatively compared. Even then, clinical clerkships can be seen as a stage where the goal is to look good all the time. People walk on the wards, hey, look at me, I'm good at these 17 things. Does a person ever walk on the words really and say, look, I'm really bad at these 17 things. I need to help. I need you to help me when a grade is at stake. They often don't do that. And so we as a medical establishment kind of snapped into the fixed mindset grid where the goal is to look smart in every situation. I see the rat now. No, it's there. I see it. Here it go. Next person go, right? So what ends up happening is feedback should minimize risk. If, if you're afraid that your grade is at stake or something high stake is at stake, you know this, people don't want it. And feedback will be ignored in that environment, which, which happens all the time, even, in a, even if the competency-based medical education uh, intent is there. If it's over, if we're superseded by a grade or a goal that's not in sync, this is what happens. So do we have normalized deviance in medical education? Well, this is the way we've always done it. You know, well, I think the deans know better than us. These students are smart. They'll figure it out when they get there. How can you run a medical school without grades, really? Take your student off and put on your management hat. Hey, students, I gotta get honors. I'm not gonna raise my hand here. I gotta get that top grade or I won't get the residency of my choice. Who's in the C-suites? Rarely students. And then finally, you know, the students are happier. We, we send out those reports every single uh, quarter, right? Uh, students are in a grade. And I think that this is a bit of normalized deviance. If outside people see this, the situation is deviant. When I talk to my, and inside people see it as accustomed to it. When I talk to my own students and I go through this with them and I say, when you're you know, calling your mom up or your dad up to tell you about medical school, do you, do you say, you know, a good part of my day is hiding my own weaknesses so nobody else sees it? Uh, can you imagine that? What do they think about that? And of course, the obvious response is that's crazy. I can't believe that that's happening. And that's, that's the experience of many students. It was my experience for sure. Normalized deviance ends when a sentinel event occurs, something big, huge, and bad or an outsider makes the problem visible to all. Classic examples of normalized deviances have been the Wall Street meltdown. So this, this in the Wall Street meltdown in 2008, these, these folks were creating these really complex derivatives that were betting for other people to lose and they would win when other people lose. It sounds terrible, right? Because it is, but it didn't start in a minute. It just got there and then something really bad happened and we could all see it. This boat went down the Casa Concordia 
this is a classic case of normalized deviance. They, this was off the course of, coast of Italy, and they kept getting closer to the side of the uh, the Italian coastline, and that people would wave from the coastline, and people away from the boat became a big thing. So the boat captain kept going off the charted path little by little, not all at once, but eventually got too close and hit a reef and went down. And now we can see it, and it's terrible. And Wells Fargo in the United States went down because they were high pressure sales. They incentivized their their um, salespeople uh, to 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 sell eight things to every customer. And so what they were doing, the salespeople were, as soon as you, they got your information and you only bought one thing and you hung up the phone, they would open up seven other accounts or whatever in your name using your data, get the credit for the account and then close the account, making havoc with your credit score, but whatever. And of course that's completely deviated and it came out. Here's the thing about medical education though. Uh, we got all kinds of this deviance and neither the Sentinel events that everyone talks about or outsiders seeing it has made a difference. Here's my friend Ben Kinnear re recreating a study in which people ask this question. There's a study done. If, if you graduate something, somebody either um, from your program and you're one of these folks, the PD, the APD, or the, CC, the clinical competency committee, would you trust your loved ones to every single person you graduated? And uh, Ben did this non-scientific poll that was almost the same as the study, showing that about a half of people have graduated people that they wouldn't fully trust. This is not unknown. This is well known, and yet we don't change. We know this, that assessment for educational safety leads to leniency. Everybody gets high scores. Range restriction, we only use a little part of the scale, and a halo effect. And I, I don't know if competency-based medical education has gotten rid of all of this. Um, maybe some. I don't usually put so many uh, references on a uh, slide, but I have to convince people here in the United States that this is actually a thing. So I like to hit them over the head. And I like to run through this like, what in the re in the medical school file, all this assessment we do on people for years, what is in the file that predicts performance and residency? This idea that uh, you've watched somebody for four years, you've got a good assessment, right? And I should be able to see the truth and it should predict what's happening. Well, in pediatrics, there's no objective factor that can reliably predict performance. In neurology, they did a study, no significant relationship between step scores, which is our test scores that they take, and resident quality. The step scores are the the third year medical students take step one and, and step two are just licensing exams in order to get to, um, to residency. But there's no relationship between those scores and quality. ENT application factors may not be predictive of future capabilities. LBGYN objective data did not correlate with performance. Radiology, Dean's letters, letters of recommendation, AOA, the Honor Society doesn't predict performance. Dermatology, no one factor predicts performance. Where I live in internal medicine, higher test scores were associated with higher test scores but not with other outcomes. Letters of recommendation regarding professionalism. Um, this is from the Mayo Clinic and professionalism I know is a, is a term that is kind of rife with possible bias, I get that. But in this study, they found that if you were in the top 10% uh, in the letter writer's mind that you didn't have quote professionalism problems later in residency, but there were no other letters to not predict anything else. There's no link between step scores and whatever and in multiple different, um, multiple different uh, domains of medicine and whether or not you're going to be selected as chief. We got so obsessed with this in our own program. This is a paper that we wrote. We tried to figure out what predicts what in residency. And we took all of these different things on the left here and say, well, what correlates with uh, these things? And we actually, it was a cool study because it wasn't just what I thought of you. We actually got patient opinions, peer opinions. Yes, the faculty opinions. We looked at test scores and uh, all this came out in the wash. And the only thing that predicted performance was the second test. And it wasn't that strong. So let's not get too carried away here, but nothing else predicted performance. So what is the deal? Is this an era of commission that the medical schools know about the learners and they're choosing to withhold it? Or is it an era of omission where they just don't know the learners well enough to communicate? Normally I take a break here, we'll do this at the end, but think about yourself, which is it? I actually think it's omission. I think that our assessment systems are poor. And so it's just data, bad data in, bad data out. And, and whatever is commuted to, communicated to us is just not good data. Uh, and so they can't tell the truth about the learners because they don't really know it. So this is uh, this is my daughter driving a car. I was thinking about, I don't know if this is gonna work. This is my 15 and a half year old daughter driving my 23 year old car. I was teaching her, it's the first day she don't ever wreck. drove. Don't wreck. And I'm saying don't wreck. So uh, what if we did driving school this way that I'm really good at left turns, but I. Let me show you left turns. I have never done a right turn before, right? Or, you know, flight school. I'm really good at landings, 
I'm really good at takeoffs, not so good at landings. Let me just show you my takeoffs. Or I'm really good at the chickens as a food processor or food inspector, but not so good at the cows. Or what if I only know how to play a key of C, but let me show you a C and you judge me on that. This is kind of what we're doing if we're not careful. So normalized deviance ends when a sentinel event occurs and outsider makes a problem visible all. I think we've had enough sentinel events and a lot of people talking about it. And maybe now we're just about to change. Maybe, but I, I, I don't know. So what can we do? That's the question. And I, I like to raise problems, which I've done, and maybe think about possible solutions, but then talk about the nuance there. So that's the second half of my talk. And then I would love to have a conversation with you uh, about what we just, what I just reviewed. So I'm sure you're all familiar with Van der Vluten's work. This is my favorite paper because it's sort of like a greatest hits where uh, he took the 12 tips uh, format and went through his all, all his research up into 2015. I'll get to some newer research here soon. And I really think that uh, if you're setting up an assessment system, this is a great place to start. And what I want to try to do in the next few minutes is to, is to go through these tips with a safety lens on, to think about psychological safety and educational safety as you're setting up your own assessment system. So the first tip that he says is develop a master plan for assessment. So I think, you know, I set up an assessment system 10 years ago. I didn't think about this then. How does this entity that I'm creating affect the psychological or educational safety of the participants? I think it's actually important to think about it ahead of time. And if you've already created the system, maybe going back and thinking about it now and be deliberate. And I can tell you that we've set up a lot of unsafe things. And even now we haven't ferreted all of them out. Tip, tip, tip two in these 12 tips is to develop examination regulations that promote feedback orientation. Do your tools promote growth mindset or fixed slash performance-based minds by, based mindset. And it's so interesting, you can sort of do the thing like competency-based medical education and still promote a fixed mindset, depending on how you set it up. Um, so the goal of growth mindset, if you're familiar with Dweck's work is, instead of looking smart in every situation where the goal is to protect yourself, it's to go where it's hard. We have this phrase in our own, our own world here about our academic half day, where we spend a half day learning. Hey, when you come to half day, I actually don't care what you know, you already know it. I wanna know what you don't know. I wanna be in that space where the desirable difficulties are, as it's been said, uh, and you need to feel safe to do that. Otherwise, it's a terrible experience for you. Can you be over here? That's what growth mindset is about. So if your assessment is to really rate people on really big things, this is my opinion now, if it says patient care, medical knowledge, communication skills, professionalism, or really, really big EPAs, like manage an ambulatory patient, um, then you've really aligned the system to personhood and self, making the assessment inherently unsafe. If you're saying communication skills or manage a, and a patient, I mean, that's, that's a whole of me. And if you're giving me a rating, it's not on this task I did, it's me. And so it becomes a little less safe. And if your assessment rating scale, which I know you're not doing this now, but if it's, if it's normative, uh, then you, you have trouble. Like, I think we still use normative scales, even in competency-based learning sometimes. Because if, if, if you've done that, then you've indicated that growth is a negative and you've chosen winners or losers, even if everyone is good enough. If there's a criterion and there's still a best and a worst, everyone's good enough. The person at the bottom still feels bad about themselves if you tell them they're last or below average. So if the goal is to get to, I usually make this analogy, to get to Chicago by one o'clock and some people are early and some people get right, right on time, no problem. If the goal is to get there first, you're doing something different. So um, if you set up systems like this where you're assessing big things that are close to humanhood and or personhood, and then you have some normative comparison stuck in there. I think you, you promote poor feedback orientation and the safety is, is less. So think about that. I, and hopefully you've gotten rid of all this, but some places in our, our place, you know, it took us a while to do that. So here's what we're doing. This is, this is just to give me a sense of what we're doing. This is now a little bit old, but we created a system called observable practice activities. They're called OPAs. It's a cheap knockoff of EPAs. But when we wrote our paper, the person who reviewed us said what we had weren't EPAs back then. Now they're really, they're really nested EPAs, tiny little bits. So not the whole, the tiny, the tiny bits. And so things like initiate insulin or manage pneumonia, these are observable things that we can see people do in time. And so what we did was we rewrote, rewrote the entire curriculum of medicine here and all the assessment forms specific to the rotation and the level of the learner. It never made sense to me that the endocrinology evaluation and the MICU evaluation would have the same words on it. Why are we asking the same things when the skills are different. And so we're asking very specific skills. So all the forms are different. Here's an example of just one. This is digestive diseases or gastroenterology for the PGY1, just a few examples. Can you write initial mission orders for GI bleeding, initiate nutrition, perform parasentesis? These are very specific skills to this rotation, 
and I can see you do it. When you get on, it gets a little more difficult. Now it's, can you manage the whole, not the parts, but the whole. You don't get the chance to manage the whole until you can manage the parts. That's how we're doing it. And, and we know that no one whole person holds the whole truth about you. We work in a constructivist world uh, where there is no truth, but we can try to get closer if we can aggregate. And so we ask different people different things about performance, and then we try to aggregate that together um, and, and then try to make sense of it. And our, our rating scale is entrustment. It's a trust rating scale. We have five levels of trust. Level one is we don't trust you because you have a critical deficiency. This doesn't feel very good, but it can be very formative that you weren't prepared to be in this moment. Let's get you prepared. If you want to see our experience, Dr. Kinnear, who's on the call, they did write a paper on our, our, our critical efficiency raisings. They were fascinating stuff. We can talk about it. Most people, though, will begin residency with uh, presumptive trust. You can be here, but we're going to watch you take care of this patient with direct supervision. And then as you begin to prove yourself, you can get indirect supervision and then hopefully no supervision at all. I can sign off. And maybe if you're aspirationally good, you can, you can teach the twos, you'll get a five. But the goal is a progression. And then le level six is really important that if you didn't see a skill, please don't rate the skill. We don't want garbage data. So we give our faculty carte blanche to not complete the things they didn't see. Um, some of them get that. We've changed our narrative questions because yeah, there's ratings, but really the magic is in the narrative. That's where the richness is. So we ask the typical questions, describe two strengths, tell us two things they can do, get better, be specific. And we've actually changed our, our assessment forms to put the questions first, the narrative first. There was some evidence to say that if you put the narrative last, people will get fatigued and they don't want to type. Start with the narrative, you get a little more, a little more narrative. We back, we found that, that uh, we get a little more uh, written about people. Then we ask a couple questions looking forward. Is this person ready for the next level? Well, what do you think? Wherever you're at today. This is this kind of feeds that fire of summation. Just tell me where they're at today. And because uh, people feel like they got to do it. And then tell us why, but be specific. If you don't tell us why, then we're not going to trust your rating. And then if you've, you've said this person could be unsupervised, just, just justify it. It stops a little grade inflation and it gets us information so we can judge the person who did the judging as to whether they actually saw the thing they, they're reporting to us. These are some things we found over the years that have been helpful. What happens when you set a system up based on these characteristics? Well, here's the a paper from a few years ago after we collected 300,000 data points. And what you're looking at here is time on the x-axis. Internal medicine in the United States is 36 months. So there's a 36 months. And then trust on the y-axis where this is direct supervision, indirect supervision, and then four is no supervision. And what this represents here is all the entrustments have made of the PGY1s in the first year, in this uh, first month, I'm sorry, in the second month, in the third month, all the way to the end. And even though every entrustment is made independent of the others, you don't know what someone gave this person two months ago or what they're going to get two months from now. You put your score down. Um, we found that trust rises over time with a pretty high R squared value. So you can predict where you're at when you're on one point line, you know where you're going to be. Um, and so the potential for people coming into our program, the potential is that you don't have to be perfect from day one, that the goal is to grow. And we have a system now that can measure that growth over time. And that is the goal. Rather than being at the end or trying to be perfect, you don't have to be at the beginning. And I'll say potential because you have to intuitively get this and then act in ways that match up with this. And, uh, and we'll talk about it later today. I think most of the residents in our program get it and understand it, but not everybody and not every time. Uh, but at least we have this potential. Step three is to collect, uh, adopt a robust system for collecting information. Are you using your information system to the fullest? I know that everyone's getting into learning analytics and all kinds of systems, but sometimes, you know, when my 80 year old dad had a computer, he just used it for email and not much else. So sometimes we do that with our systems. So, um, and, do, and our safety guards built in and do learners believe it? There's a lot of this idea of anon anonymity and uh, residents just are in this world where there's news and fake news and people can get into everything. It's really hard to say that it's safe and anonymous or, and, you just have to be as transparent as possible so people can see uh, what you're doing. And they still might not believe it, but I think it's, it's, hard, it's important to work towards this. Tip four is to assure that every low stakes assessment provides meaningful feedback for learning. Are the tools specific and actionable enough? And have you established criterion referencing over normative comparisons? It's a really hard thing to do, but, but important. Um, let's talk about specificity and criterion referencing. Because I think through those two things, you might get to meaningful feedback. So normative, we know it's all about comparing others to others and criterion is hit the measure, hit the mark. What is it? What is it? And there's a lot of nuance around both of these things. Glad to talk about it. But 
I want to show you a place in which we um, which we switched from normative comparisons to criterion referencing and uh, and found value in doing that. So what I'm showing you here is a scorecard of, of a resident in our practice. And what we're measuring is their actual care delivery at the level of the patient. And on the left are all the measures that we happen to be following in this ambulatory practice. And these numerators and denominators represent their particular numerators and denominators for their patient panel. Most residents in our practice have about 200 patients. And then we can say who's getting what. And then we can see whether they've hit the target. That's green. If they're close to the target, the criterion, that's yellow. If they're far away, it's red. If they're getting better over time, it's blue. So there isn't really a comparison here uh, so much. The value is, did you hit the target or not? We do get some normative comparisons over here for relative strengths and weaknesses. So you know what you need to work on. Like this person was 34th in this measure, but first in this. So maybe you should put a little more energy here. And how can I help you as your program director to get better at that? And what skills do you need? And I can get some formative feedback there. And you can actually see whether you hit the goal or not. So this sounds good, but it's actually hard to pull off, you know, using data like this. Because if you think about this, this is a flu shot data from a couple of years ago. In, in November, this person's flu shot rate was 55%, but by March, it was 72%. Now, do we give credit to the resident for that? Because there's a lot in the middle there that affects whether a patient gets a flu shot. It isn't just you and your decision. There's a supplier. Like this year, our flu shots were delayed because there was a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. So my practice looked worse than others, but it wasn't her fault. It was that the shots got delayed. And there's a scheduler. Do they do the right thing? The nurse, you know, they, they might have some conversations. Then there's you, and then there's the patient themselves. And if you, if you do, you know, comparisons, what you'll see here is that the ninth person in this data set, this particular data set was at this time was at 59% correct or done. And the 21st person was at 51%. This, those numbers are probably not different, but there's a ninth and 21st. Having said that, 72% is really different than 37%. Not, those differences are probably not based on the system or the other people. That might be the duck. And so this is the problem I'm getting at when you're, when you're talking about normative uh, and criterion referencing is this problem of attribution versus contribution. Contribution is the extent to which each team member confers a patient outcome, how we work together to create the outcome. So we're on a team, we're all giving, and I'm a part of that. Whereas attribution is the parts of the outcome directly associated with one individual, how my work directly relates to the patient outcome. And in clinical environment, it's really hard to tease this out. Um, a lot of people are working on it, but if that, this particular nut has not been cracked. Here's what we do in our practice to try to get at a both end here. So if you look at all the measures that I've got there, all those measures, and there's a target performance um, to hit. If you hit the target, it's green. If you're close, it's yellow. If it's far away, it's red. So there's a, there's a criterion referencing. You either did it or you did not do it. But if you pick up the worst panel of patients in the practice, you shouldn't be penalized if you move them from 36 to 26. You did something, even though they're still low, right? You might not hit the targets. So we give credit for an improvement goal, a second goal. If you can just get better by, in this particular example, 2%. And then we just look for places in which neither goal was hit. You didn't hit the target and you didn't hit the improvement goal. And now I can just look at a few things to say, okay, let me help you get better. What, what is it that's getting in the way of all this? Let's sit down together and try to be formative about it so I can help you without you feeling too bad. So this way people get credit for the good work, like all this work, work they did, even though they didn't hit all the target all the time. And it can be two things that they're doing well. And if you go into a data set like this, you'll see there's people like this. This is a resident, the only resident to ever do it. I, I used his name with permission because uh, I asked him. He did it. There were no no's. Uh, incredible. But in the same cohort as this person was this person. Uh, a lot different. And it, that person is probably... Uh, attributable, some of the outcome are attributable to this person and, and their workflow. But again, I, I need to be, um, I need to be uh, criterion reference. So for this particular case, this person doesn't know that they're last. They don't know what the other person did. They just know about the target. I know this, but, uh, but that's not important to me. What's important to me is that they need to get better and I need to help them. So our solution is sort of a hedge in the attribution contribution. We, we use a little bit of both with the majority being criterion referencing. Because when you use criteria referencing, it raises all of the boats. But I do think that a person can sink a boat if they want to. So um, we can talk about whether this makes sense in your environment. But if you're going to use clinical data as part of assessment, you can, you can certainly make it unsafe if it's all normative comparisons. So we try to get a little criterion in there uh, and, and really minimize the normative, the normative piece as much as we can. But we don't get rid of all of it because I don't think that you can.
So I think the medicine should be pass fail, but the bar of pass should be high enough that it makes best irrelevant. This is what I think. And uh, you might think, what does that mean? So in air, and I know aviation, the whole comparing the aviation is tired and aviation works in a complicated world and we work in a complex world, I get that. But for this point that I'm making that the bar of pass should be high enough that it makes the best irrelevant. There's probably a best Delta airline pilot, but it doesn't matter because even the worst pilot lands all the planes every day. So the difference between the best and, the, and, and good enough is really tiny. And that's what I'm getting at. I don't know if we can ever get there in medicine, but uh, we won't get there if we don't think about what pass really means. And it has to mean something important um, or else we get into this business where um, good enough is a pejorative and nobody wants to hear that they're good enough. So can we make the pass meaningful so that good enough really means it? Tip five is to provide mentoring to learners. You shouldn't give data without guidance. Can you imagine if I give a whole bunch of data, you know, go to your car replace and they, they give you a spreadsheet of the stuff, you don't know what it means, right? And so you need to have guidance when you give information to people. So you're gonna gather this information, they need help with it. And you should disconnect coaching from summative assessment. Now, Vanderbilt uses the term mentor. I think mentor is over here on the giving answers and experts side. We use coaching in our program, which is more asking questions. So if I'm gathering data on people and I wanna give them information, then I need somebody who's gonna be asking questions instead of telling answers. And so Drs. Kinnear and Awoshka set up a personal coaching program in our program. You get a coach when you, when you uh, show up here. Uh, and the goal is to take all this data that we collect in assessment and give them some, something to chew on, assessment for learning. And for a few years, uh, they had set up the program to be using the R2C2 method of coaching. Uh, but this year, uh, Ben has really pushed us to adopt the master adaptive learning platform. I'm sure you've seen this, it's, uh, it's well publicized. It has four parts to it. The first part is, is what are the goals? What are the things I need to prioritize? And that's all the data that I gather on somebody should be sense made. So I'm gonna gather the data. Here are the things I'm best and worst at. And let me, let me have that conversation in a safe environment between me and the coach in which there's no risk to me to have this conversation. Uh, if it's between me and the program director, it doesn't feel safe. But the coach that's connected from the program director can really have these conversations, we hope. And then you have to think about your learning strategies. What are the way I'm gonna get better? Um, and I, I, need, I need help and I need to do that in a safe environment. And then you go out and you get feedback and it says informed self-assessment. Again, uh, in the Dunning-Kruger world, you don't often know your own performance and your coach and you have to have a safe conversation and that's hard to do. And then you have to go out into the world and try again. And what we say is you can't, we can't prepare everybody for every novel situation, but we can prepare them for how they approach novel situations through all these things are the batteries of the, of the master adaptive learning system, curiosity, motivation, mindset, growth mindset, and resilience. So this is what we're trying this year. It's been really interesting. Ben is on the call. Hopefully he'll be able to answer questions about how coaching is going this year as we're doing this work with our residents. Tip six is really interesting to me, to ensure trustworthy decision-making. You need to understand the biases and inequities that may be present in your assessment system, even in a competency-based world, and mitigate that as best you can, or at least to understand them. We can't de-bias ourselves, as Kahneman says, but we can mitigate that bias. So I'm showing you here the best fit lines. This is the, the actual best fit of 189 people. But if I was to actually show you the 189 people in this data set, look at this mess, right? It's, it's all over the place because we're not machines. We are humans. And the question is, which line is me? And am I on the right line for me? We did a G study uh, of our data, which the G study seeks to understand the contribution of variance to any point. So if you get a score, what, what percent of the variance is the resonant or the question that's the OPA or the rater or the rotation? And what we found is uh, that the, the contribution of variance is 19%. In fact, the rater, any score that's given has more to do with the rater than the rate. Now this is well known. In fact, the exact same thing was found in, um, in uh, grade school teaching. They actually found the only exact same thing. So the issue is that um, we got, so if you know that you can find value anyway. And I, this may not work, this metaphor I'm about to give to you, but a sunflower is a really big thing, but we only eat the little seed. There's still value in that. So we know better to eat the seeds and not the stem. Does that work for you? It works for me. But uh, another way to say it is that all models are flawed, but some have value. So can you find the value even though you know this is going on? And so we spent these last 10 years working in this learning analytics field, trying to mitigate the biases. I don't have time to talk about this dashboard. That's a different story. It doesn't even look like this anymore, but 
Um, our goal is to try to understand what the ups and downs mean and give people a fair picture as to whether or not they're making progress over time. Um, and so th the problem is, as you know, as Deming says, information isn't knowledge. Knowledge is data divided by noise times interpretation. You have to interpret everything. It has to go through the committee, through the people. There's no truth, there's only interpretation. And so if there's noise and data that can't be trusted from the residents' perspective, because there is bias or whatever effect is causing the data to be the data that has to do with the resident, then they're not gonna want to hear from you. And it's unsafe on many levels. And so we're, we've been on this mission to try to make it real as possible. Um, so you might, as you're thinking about your own data, think about, do you have data or noise and are you interpreting properly and how do you know all that stuff? Um, and how do, you, how do your learners feel about it? Tip seven is to organize intermediate decision-making assessments Make the work of your clinical competency committee transparent. They should know what you're doing behind closed doors. We've tried, I'm just telling you, we've tried this many times over, um, but residents still wonder what we're doing back there, even though we've said it. But I do think the second part uh, is really important. You should move your CCC to problem identification to developmental. And I know that many of you are doing this, but in the old days, we weren't doing that. Problem identification is, you know, tell me who the people are that are low flyers and, and let me see if I can help them. And, and now we've moved to like, everybody should get better. And the competency committee can be part of that in, in a safe way. So if you're discussing the competency committee, it does not necessarily mean that something bad is happening. In the old days, it was just focused on global performance. Are they doing okay? Well, they're okay. But now we're really examining specific strengths and weaknesses. What can and can't they do specifically? Competences in the old days was just implicit. Just they're not failing, they're, they're succeeding. But now it's based on criterion and milestones. And the Ken Meds roles, for example, or EPAs. Feedback used to be delivered with, we didn't really have any feedback. That's why they, they couldn't see what we're doing. And now we give the feedback to the coach. So once the competence committee has reviewed the data, we type it up and give it to the coach and the learner together to read through. And then we're out. And it's up to them to go work on that in a safe way. And then they can go um, and just be better. And that's our goal. Tip eight is to encourage and facilitate personalized remediation. We need to normalize all the things I'm talking about, feedback, coaching, and growth. What if negative feedback was just called feedback? Anytime I say the word negative, it, your shields go up and you don't want it. Again, it feels unsafe. So um, can we get to the place where it's just, it's just feedback and we're all on it? Now, this is really hard. I get that. But I think that in our own program, we've worked it for many years now, growth mindset, normalizing this. We've gotten to a different place than we used to be. I'm not saying it's perfect, but certainly different about receiving feedback. There are four other tips that you can go read about uh, that I'm gonna uh, skip now for the sake of um, expediency. All right, so I don't want you to think that it's all rainbows and unicorns, everything I said, how I'll just do all this and it's so easy, that's not fair. And there's this great paper by Watling and Ginsburg that I'm sure you've seen, it's one of the great papers ever written in which they write, medical learners often perceive assessment with formative intent as summative. That perception may then interfere with the intended educational effect. So you set up all of this with safety in mind, and yet it still doesn't matter, right? It's so tough. A way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. So we as the people, when we set these things up, we have to understand that we may be blind to what the learner is actually feeling. Even so, even with all the effort. As Van der Vluten and his team said, conceptualization of assessment stakes as a continuum was strongly related to a learner's perceived ability to act, control, and make choices within the learning and assessment environment, their sense of control. So if you think about, uh, coming back to our assessment conceptualizations, is our goal when we're learners the learning conception or the accounting conception? The difference between formative and summative. And the way I like to think about this is what they said here. When teachers' assessment conceptualizations were more focused on accounting conceptions, this risk creating tension in the teacher learning assessment relationship. So when you're with somebody, is it a driving lesson or a driving test? And what are you thinking? And what are they thinking? So I like two by two squares. Here's one uh, between uh, teachers and learners and lessons and tests. If you both think it's a lesson and you're both on the same page, then that can be formative. It requires effort because if one of you falls off the page, it's not good, but it's relatively safe because you're both there to do the work together. If you both think it's a test, well, that's summative and you know it's coming. The, the safety is variable, but at least you can get your shields up and be ready for it, right? Um, 
Now, if the learner thinks it's a lesson and the teacher thinks it's a test, I call that uninformative because when the, when the teacher is, is summating in a report that should not be summating, then it's risky because you can put this in the record and it can stay forever, even though they only saw one thing. I think of it like baseball. If you see a pitcher who had 31 wins in a season on the only game that they lost and you write a report, this pitcher is a loser and it gets into the, that's not true and it's risky, not good for the learner, not good for anyone really. Probably the dominant mode here is that the teachers think it's a lesson, but the learners think it's a test. And that's performative. That's what we've been talking about all day today. It's sensitive to hierarchy. You know, who am I? I'm the program director. No matter what I say, people want to impress me because I'm the program director. And if I was just a faculty member, they would have a little less performative desire. And I get that. And so we need to be sensitive to all this. How do we move into the right boxes? I think it has to happen on expectations and structure. And it has to be on the macro. Everything has to walk the walk from the system you create to the faculty that are doing the assessments to the, to the residents. It has to be in the meso. The learners have to, when they're talking about it, have to talk growth mindset and, and driving lessons. Otherwise it's not going to happen. It has to be in the micro when you're with the learner. I think that any one of these levels, if it doesn't have the right set of expectations and structure, blows the whole thing up. And it's really hard. Um, it's been a 10 year journey for us to get to where we're at today and we have lots to go. Still, if you want to see what our learners think about all this, we made a video called Growth Mindset, um, not a very original title, but um, you can go to Google and just Google University of Cincinnati Growth Mindset, and you'll find this video. What I like about this, this six minute video is you hear from the learners themselves about what they want. And it's a reminder, you know, who is getting affected and what they want. So I invite you to go watch that video. I won't play it today. So to finish, I believe in appreciative inquiry. I like this, this sense of, of uh, the four stages. Hey, what is the best of what is the discovery? And then you dream of what might be, and then you design to do something better, and then you work together to do it. I love appreciative inquiry, especially the first two steps. So let's go to the dream part. What if assessment minimized unnecessary risk? What if we really did that? Can't get rid of all risk, but the unnecessary part that's not helpful. And what if most assessment and feedback was for learning so that all this energy is making somebody get better? and not just labeling them. And what if good enough was excellent and made the best irrelevant? What if all that happened? What would it, what it look like? All right, I have given my presentation, given you something to think about. Um, love to have a conversation. I'm not sure how we do this. Uh, what's the yeah. way that your group does it? Okay, that's where I come in. First, thank you for that. Um, you're tackling a very complicated topic, so you've covered the breadth of it for sure. Um, I'll just start out by highlighting some comments. Clearly you have some fans here. Um, so Heather Waters wanted to share some similar um, thinking around um, collective group reasoning that Adam Grant has talked about in his book um, and the value of psychological safety. Uh, and then Paul Geisler uh, says, excellent talk, Eric. Um, and then he quotes John Lim uh, where he said, good assessment should enable us to achieve the goals we have set out on together. So I think the together part for me is really the key here. And you've shown us the many ways where we're not necessarily achieve, trying to get these goals um, achieved together. Um, and David um, Kartash uh, asks, if you have any additional insights, uh, maybe specifics around how admission, like the whole system, the whole setup, you know, admission, selection criteria, pre-med and basic science, courses, content, the teaching methods, uh, the assessment per, uh, via multiple choice exams, those high stakes, you know, sit in a room and sweat for six hours and get ranked amongst your class assessments contributes to a lack of a culture of psychological safety. Yeah, I think that all of it does. And we just wrote a paper that I'm actually proud of called The Prisoner's Dilemma uh, about the residency match that goes through all of this. And the point that we make in there is that, um, you know, it's a pyramid, right? There's always, there's a best and a less best and a third best and a fourth best. That's the way we, you know, cause dominance hierarchy is a, uh, dominance hierarchy is a, is a basic primate human behavior. This is what we do. We rank everything. We rank medical schools. We rank people in those medical schools. We rank football teams. We rank soccer teams, right? So I don't think that you can get rid of that energy. And we made this constant, this idea that Stop worrying about the top, about the best. Worry about the bottom. That's where the harm is at. It's a double harm, right? The double harm of not being good at your job, not being good at the thing you should be able to do, and also feeling bad about it. So I think that all that stuff is if we could just turn out a consistent product that every 
buddy was good enough when the pre-med said they're good enough and the medical school says they're good enough and the residency says they're good enough, that they are. But we're also afraid of getting that person who's not good enough, that it makes us do all the hubris around selection criteria and all the stuff, right? And yeah. there's more to it. There's nuance of prestige and all, you know, you know, our own dominance, our own brains. But I think that we've spent so much time worrying about the top that we should spend more time at the bottom and raise the bar. That's an opinion. But we wrote it in the paper if you want to see it. It's okay, well, I'm curious to know if our audience has anything to say about that. I'll give them a moment to think about it and share. Um, I'll just point out that for logistics purposes, we're going to stop the recording right now. Anyone that